All right, everybody, so buckle up, because this was not a long episode of The Chosen, but given the amount of notes that I have for this bad boy, you can't even see that on there, uh, <laughs> this might be a pretty long video, because while this video had nothing to do with anything that actually takes place in Scripture, man, is there some historical context and some Bible stuff referenced in this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, so, once again, uh, we got Brienne with us. Here, uh, Brian, what did you think about episode three of The Chosen? Yeah, I really liked it a lot. I think I've only watched four episodes so far of mm -hmm. the entire season, but I think out of all four of those episodes, this one's my favorite mm -hmm. of all of them. Yeah, and this was your second time watching this episode. Yes, this right? is my second time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we watched it a while back, and then we were going to film a video, so we decided to rewatch it again just to retrace our brains yeah. a little bit. But I really like the simplicity of this episode. I think mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite things. It's just Jesus. And these kids mm -hmm. that come to visit him. And I really like how, especially at the beginning, and really any time that like, Jesus is by himself, it's mostly silent. Like, he's not talking, mm -hmm. he's not speaking. You're just like seeing him living mm -hmm. and seeing what he does, which is one of those things where I think also you see like Jesus' personality. Because um, oftentimes I feel like we like strip him of mm -hmm. any like human-like qualities whenever... He is human. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of those things where you just see him living and doing things that normal people do. Um, and then these kids come and he has personality and yep. he laughs with them and makes jokes with yep. them. But at the same time, has times where he's serious and is teaching them lessons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, no, this was actually, fun fact, this was the episode that actually convinced me to watch The Chosen. Because really? it was actually the first episode I'd ever seen. I mean, the first uh, clip I'd ever seen. I saw a clip of him talking with the kids under the tree. Mm -hmm. And I saw that. And I was like, you know what? Uh, like, like you know, he's quoting scripture and he's teaching them. And I just loved, like, the back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it seemed faithful to scripture. And I was like, you know, I'm usually very skeptical of shows or movies based on the Bible. Because usually they just do a terrible job of it. But this show, like, that scene convinced me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go watch this show. And then I watched the first four episodes. And then I eagerly awaited them for the, uh, I waited for them to release the next four. And then now I'm waiting for them to release season two. Yeah. Uh, so this was actually the episode that got it all started for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that being said, let's just uh, get started with it. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick um, disclaimer. If you notice me drinking this uh, Sprite right here, it's because I've got a little bit of an upset stomach right now. Mm -hmm. And I know Paul tells Timothy to, you know, drink some wine to fix his stomach up a little bit. But uh, I'm not much of a wine drinker so i'm just gonna go with some sprite uh, so if you see me drinking that that's what's going on there so let's break down the episode this yeah. uh, the episode opens up uh like you were saying with a very quiet scene mm -hmm. right it's nighttime the fire is crackling and we just see jesus mm -hmm. right which is very interesting because all the other episodes jesus hasn't jesus hasn't come in until the very end it of the is, episode yeah. right but here from the very first scene we got Jesus. And I liked how they did that. Yeah, me too. Uh, so I liked how, you know, they, they kind of tease you with him in the first two episodes. And then the third episode is like, okay, this is Jesus the whole time. Yeah. And you don't get to meet him interacting with these people you know. You get to see how he's interacting with kids. Which, mm -hmm. you get to learn a lot about somebody given how they interact with children. You know, we talked about this whenever we're watching, like, Smallville and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the best episodes are when Clark is interacting with children. Yes. Because that's where you get to see how some... Like, you get to see somebody's true colors shine right. whenever they're interacting with kids, right? How they treat them and stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I, I thought it was beautiful how they did that. Right, but it's nighttime, the fire's crackling, and Jesus is praying and he's crying out. Mm -hmm. What did you think about that scene? Because, like, he's obviously tormented mm -hmm. in this first scene. Like, he's shaking, he's sweating, he's saying, mm -hmm. God, like... You know, Father, use me. Speak through me. Mm -hmm. Father, glorify me in yourself. What did you think about that scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was it was really moving, in my opinion, especially because he is silent that whole time. And so the one time he does speak, he's doing it to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was that was really special. Yeah. I liked that a lot. I thought it was interesting that they had him, that they, they, they portrayed him praying like this. Mm -hmm. Because it was very reminiscent of how he prays when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, right mm -hmm. before he's arrested. Yes. Uh, you know, where the Bible portrays him as getting on the ground, and he's praying, and he's so scared that he's, like, sweating blood. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, Father, remove this cup from me if it be your will. Nevertheless, right. not my will, but yours be done. And I thought it was interesting that they kind of portrayed him as doing that here as well. Yeah. Like, it was almost like every time he went into prayer, he's trembling. And I guess in my mind, uh, I mean... Like, I'd always just kind of assumed that was just in the garden because that's literally like, okay, he's about to die. Yeah. And I kind of thought that. But the more I've thought about this, like, the more, this is probably my third or fourth time seeing this episode. The more I see it and the more I think about it, 
That is very possibly how he would have just prayed in general a lot of the time. He didn't just realize he came to die right before he died. Right, right, in that you know? moment. He right. knew that he was coming here for this purpose. And especially, you can think about it, where this is at in the show and in Jesus' life, he's about to embark on his ministry. Mm -hmm. So he's been on earth for like 30 years and he's about to embark on the ministry that will lead to his death. Mm -hmm. And so you can see how right here, this is him preparing. And in many ways, uh, we need to realize we should be praying in the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. with that sort of reverence where we're shaking and we're nervous, realizing we're talking to the God of the universe. Right. And we're wanting so desperately for him to use us for his glory. So just literally the first scene, I'm already moved. I'm like, yes, yes. like that's probably very accurately how Jesus was. But he's nervous and he's, he's, he's crying out, God, glorify me in yourself. Father, 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 mm -hmm. speak through me. And I was like, that, that, was, that was good. Uh, and it was very brief. Very brief yes. scene, and then it cuts to the opening credits, mm -hmm. right? And then we get the, you know, the regular, go, child, come on in, walk yeah. on the water. Mm -hmm. Cool fish and, go in the opposite yes, direction. Yes, cool fish <laughs> go in the opposite direction. I still need to get one of those shirts. Yeah. Uh, and then we cut to the outskirts of Capernaum, or Capernaum, uh, in AD 26. Mm -hmm. So once again, we're going with the YouTube timeline here. Yes. Uh, where it is AD 26, and presumably they're building it up to where he's going to be uh, ministering to people until AD 30, where he dies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we meet this girl named Abigail. Mm -hmm. And she's leaving her house, and she says she's going by the stream, and she comes by this camp, uh, the same camp that we just saw uh, in the previous scene, mm -hmm. and she comes by this camp where she sees some wood that's been worked upon, you know, and she finds some tools that are obviously like a carpenter's tools. Yes. Right? And so mm -hmm. she's she's looking around. She grabs a spoon, and she starts, like, feeding her doll, you know, because mm -hmm. she's got this like, little doll her mom made her, and she yeah. grabs a spoon, and she's, like, feeding the doll, and then she puts that down, and then she goes over, and she finds, like, a little boat. She puts her doll on the boat. She's like, ooh, look, I'm sailing away. Uh -huh. And she's basically just come across what to a kid would be, like, just like a treasure chest. Yeah. And she's like, ooh, Toys. look, this is fun. <laughs> uh, she finds some fruit. That I think we were thinking it was like prunes or something, yeah. right? And she thinks about eating some, but then like I guess she gets convicted and she's like, "No, I can't eat these. These aren't mine." Yeah. And so she puts them away, uh, and then she all of a sudden hears a voice, and she's like, "Ah!" And she like gets out of there. Mm -hmm. And she goes and hides behind some rocks while this man humming, you know, kind of walks in there. You know, Jesus, like it's Jesus, right? Yeah. I don't know what he was humming. I tried to listen closely and figure out what it was, but mm -hmm. he's humming some song. You know, Jesus got some music in his soul, mm -hmm. uh, and he walks onto the scene. Uh, and then um, the man notices her as she runs away. Mm -hmm. Right. So what did you think about this kind of introduction? And what did you think about the character of Abigail? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was cool that they decided to use a kid. I'm trying to, like, go back to where I thought originally whenever mm -hmm. I first watched it. Because yeah. now I'm watching it a second time and I already knew, like, what was coming. I thought it was cool that they were using a kid. And I know when I first watched it, I was like, oh, I really hope this whole episode is just going to be, like, about um, Jesus' relationship and, like, talking mm. to her and getting to know her because mm. I really love any time that, like, people get to, you know, interact with mm. kids and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, that scene was also mostly silent, too, which mm. I thought was cool. Yeah. Well, I like the simplicity of this whole episode, right? Whenever yeah, you look yeah. at it, not a lot happens. Uh, I mean, really, this episode probably covers the most amount of days than any other episode. Because yeah, a lot of the other ones, of you know, it's just like over like two days or something, but a lot's happening in that time period. Right. Whereas this one, I was really having a tough time keeping track of how many days because uh, I didn't really even notice it till this watch through as I was taking notes. But it's literally like day, night, day, night, day, night. I was like, oh, yeah. a lot of time is passing here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this actually seems to be the earliest episode in the season mm -hmm. because they've already spent a few days with Jesus and they're like, where were you that one day? And he's like, oh yeah, I was with this woman, but... We'll get there. Uh, but yeah, so it's a very simple episode, and I love that. Yeah. Like, not a whole lot happens. They just really take their time. They've only got eight episodes in this season. Mm -hmm. And the temptation, like, if I was creating the show, the temptation would be, like, let's just get in like this. Pack it like, in. Let's pack it in yeah. with all scripture stuff. And they do that, but they do it in a very creative way. Right. Where what they're doing is they're giving you Old Testament context so that when you get to the New Testament stuff, it makes a lot more sense, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. brilliant. And so I really like just like the writing style there. I just want to give props to that because not only is this show well produced, it's well written. Uh, and it's actually really cool how they just took their time to just make this very simple episode that really fleshes out a lot of perspectives, a lot of cultural things, a lot of historical things, mm -hmm. and a lot of biblical things. So I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, and so that evening, we see Jesus, and he's trying to start a campfire, and he's sweating. And once again, these are all just little details that I love because they're things we don't see. Absolutely. Right? They're things yeah. that we haven't seen in other stuff, but I love how uh, it emphasizes Jesus' humanity yes. while also not taking away from his divinity. Right, you know, that's the right. cool thing. Like you can see this, and the way Jonathan Rumi, the actor, plays it, you can see that this person is more than just a man, mm -hmm. but he is also a man. Yes. Right. So whenever you talk, like whenever you have the kids interacting with him, you just get this understanding. Like this guy knows more 
than the absolutely. regular man knows. Yes, absolutely. You know, but at the same time, you know, he's making a campfire. And sure, like you pointed out, uh-huh. he's really good at making campfires. Yeah. Like, he just gets that thing set up real quick. Mm, yeah. But at the same time, he's also sweating. It's just really cool to me to where, like, they do a very good job balancing that. Because a lot right. of the times, even in our churches... Uh, depending on our different theological perspectives and stuff, sometimes we tend to conflate one side of Jesus without having a balanced perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we like overemphasize the divinity and we take away from his humanity. But then sometimes we overemphasize the humanity and we strip away his divinity. Right. And we don't want to do either of those. We want to hold that tension there because that's what the Bible holds. Uh, because that's that's who Jesus was, right? He was God in the flesh. Right. And so I, I like how they do that to where you see this guy and you're like, wow. Like, this guy's important, Mm -hmm. but he's also just a man. You know, he's, like, making a fire, and he's, like, sweating. You're like, whoa, that's really cool. Just really little details. I just love everything about how he's portrayed here. Yes, yes. Very cool. Uh, So we see Jesus starting a campfire. He's sweating. Uh, And then we see him even cutting up onions. He's cooking food. And then that scene just ends. We don't actually see him praying. We just see him look up into the heavens, Mm -hmm. right? And then it just kind of cuts. Yeah. Right? And we actually cut to Abigail's house. And Abigail's mother is doing what most mothers do at the dinner table. And she's just rambling on about her friend Joanna and some sort of uh-huh. some sort of drama that's going on. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I told Joanna this. And then her husband got in. And like she's <laughs> just talking. I don't even know what the whole thing was. Okay. And then she turns to her husband. She's like, hey, so could you go visit Joanna? And the husband, he's not listening because, you know, that's what happens at dinner tables, right? <laughs> the woman talks. The guy doesn't listen. And so she's like, can you go do this for me? And he looks up. He's like, huh? Yeah. And she's like, can you go visit Joanna? And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, like he, yeah. classic. Like I, I like just little details like that too. Like they fleshed out these characters to where you saw just this brief interaction with unimportant characters who yeah. they don't have any part in the show at all. But just for this brief moment, you're like, wow, these are fleshed out people. Yeah, that's yeah. good yeah. storytelling. You they know, because relatable. Yes, yeah. and a lot of the times whenever you're watching shows, uh, you'll have these characters and the way they talk and stuff. You're you're thinking. You only exist yeah. whenever the camera's rolling. It's like monotone yes. robotic almost. Yeah, and, and you almost can't imagine them having a life beyond the scene you're watching. Mm-hmm. Whereas just this brief moment, you know, you see this husband and wife interacting and you're like, yes, these people, they've lived together for years. They've got a daughter. This is this is classic family style yeah. uh, just 2,000 years ago. You know? yeah. <laughs> Same things. Uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, they're kind of talking. The guy reluctantly agrees to go visit her friend. Uh, and then she asks Abigail about her day. She says it was good. You know, I had a good time. She asks if she can hang out with her friend Joshua tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And the mom says, okay, but you have to be safe. You can't go swimming. You can't do any of that. But first you got to go do your chores. She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do my chores. Okay. Uh-huh. Sure, mom. I'll do that. But then at the same time, as you're watching this, it seems like Abigail's kind of hiding information from her mom. Mm-hmm. Like, you can tell she almost wants to mention Jesus. Mm-hmm. But she's also like... Eh, nah. I'll, I'll give that yeah. my own little secret. So yeah. she's kind of hiding it. She's like, can I just hang out with Joshua? Uh, and then the mom's like, okay, yeah, whatever. You can hang out with Joshua. Just be safe. Don't go swimming. Do your chores. And then the scene ends with the mom turning to the dad and asking about Joanna again. She's like, so when do you think you're going to visit Joanna? Uh-huh. And once again, you can tell that a guy probably wrote this uh-huh. just because as a guy... I've been in this situation. Somebody's telling you something, and they ask you to do something, and you reluctantly, you're just like, okay, whatever. And then they ask you, so when were you planning on doing this? And you're like, you mean the thing that I just agreed to half-heartedly 30 seconds ago? Uh-huh. Really hadn't spent much time thinking about when I was doing that, yeah. you know? I feel like the person writing the script was writing the script as this played out. You know, mm-hmm. like, he's probably writing the script. His wife's asking him to do something. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. And then he's, like, writing a little bit more. And then she's like, so when are you doing that? He's like... Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. Next thing we see is that Jesus, he's getting ready for bed, right? So I do like that basically we get to see the passage of time in yeah. this episode. And we just get to see time and time again, you know, Jesus just on his own. Like you said, a lot of silence. Mm-hmm. And Jesus on his own. The fire's crackling. Now he's getting ready for bed. And here we get to see him wash his feet, mm-hmm. right? So, um, you know, he, he hunches over. He's got like a fire. He's blowing it out. He hunches over. He gets uh, some water, washes his feet. And then he lays down. Uh, to go to sleep, and he recites the common Jewish prayer that we have heard so many other times. You know, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, But typically how we've heard it so far is, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Mm -hmm. And that's because um, in the second episode we were talking about Shabbat, right? The Sabbath. And typically they would recite this when they're about to drink wine. Mm -hmm. But that prayer, like Baruch Hatha Adonai, like that whole prayer, that is a very common prayer that Jews recite even to this day. Mm -hmm. And Usually you just add anything to the end of it. 
because it's teaching you to be grateful for everything, mm-hmm. right? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, uh, who gives us this, who gives us that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jesus, in this case, he says, who brings sleep to my eyes. Yes. And really, in many ways, I think that is something that we should learn to do. Like whenever Absolutely. Paul says, pray without ceasing, mm-hmm. I think that could be what he's referring to. He's saying, we need to learn. Like a lot of times we usually go to God in prayer when we want something. Right. But right. from a Jewish perspective, that wasn't the main focus of prayer. A lot of times you're praying just to thank God, right? You're mm-hmm. constantly saying, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, mm-hmm. who allows me to sit right here and make videos for YouTube. Yeah. Right? You know, there's a lot of people who they couldn't do this, mm-hmm. you know? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. You know, like mm-hmm. we should just be doing that constantly. Mm-hmm. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has allowed me to wake up and walk through a new day. You know, like, that should be something we're constantly doing. And so I like that they're kind of inserting that in, and we're seeing it at different places, because we see it again multiple times throughout this episode in different contexts. Uh, But then one thing I just wanted to mention there, the reason why Jesus uh, Jesus is washing his feet is because that was what uh, Jewish people did, right? Uh, If you've ever read the Old Testament, specifically uh, the Torah, which is the first five books, what we would also call the law, because that's what the word Torah means. Whenever you read those, you see that cleanliness is a big, big, big deal, Mm -hmm. according to the Jewish law. Uh, And whenever we're talking about cleanliness, we're not necessarily talking about sinfulness and non-sinfulness, right? We're not talking about that. Uh, That would be a matter of righteousness and wickedness. When we're talking about clean and unclean, we're literally talking about, like, physical cleanliness. Yes. And so I like that they added that little detail of Jesus, you know, washing his feet Mm -hmm. uh, before he goes to bed. uh, Because that was a common practice. I like just little details like that where they don't explain it. But you watch it, you're like, oh, that must have been what they did. And Mm -hmm. sure enough, that is. If you look into it. Yep, that's exactly what they did. They they washed their feet because cleanliness is a big deal to God and you want to be clean. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus goes to bed, uh, and then we go to the next day and Abigail, uh, he, uh, she is now hanging out with Joshua, Uh which fun fact, uh, the name Jesus and Joshua, they actually come from the same thing. Um, so there's like two Jesuses in this that. episode. I thought of that yeah. whenever you said that. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was fun. So Abigail, she's talking to Joshua about this man, and she's obviously super excited, mm-hmm. and she is filled with questions. This girl yeah. knows how to talk. Yeah. <laughs> she's just like the whole she walk She was spitting him out. <laughs> yeah, this whole walk there. She was just like going, 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 going. Joshua was like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll see this guy. It'll, it'll be cool. Like just... Take a chill pill, Abigail. Mm-hmm. You, need to, you need to relax a little bit. Mm-hmm. But she's excited. Yeah. And I think that's cool because that's how we should be. I was about to say, right? I feel like they did that intentionally. Mm-hmm. I feel like they made her excited for that, like, anticipation and for that constant, like, yearn to go and ask questions and mm-hmm. have a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, that she's, you know, wanting to do that. And not only for herself, but she's like, come on, Joshua. Like, I want to show you, too. And then you're going to see her bring all of her other mm-hmm. friends. And so it's going to be more and more. And so I feel like they did that intentionally. Absolutely. For her to be so excited like that. It's almost like that's what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's why Jesus is going to compliment them, saying, mm-hmm. you know, people need to have faith like children. I was just, yeah, yeah. I was just about to say that. Whenever it was a whole children, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, childlike faith. That's the first thing I thought of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so uh, Joshua and Abigail, you know, they're coming, and Abigail's super excited. Joshua's just along for the ride, and she takes them, and they hide behind the same rocks that, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she hid around before. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is really one of those fun scenes, because Jesus, he starts off, and he's reciting the same prayer that he was before, right? He says, uh, you know, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives forth bread, Mm -hmm. right? And then he pauses, and they're, like, looking over, and they're like, hmm. Uh And then... He, start, he continues talking, right? And he says, And I pray that if there are ever two children who come to my home, they will have the courage to say shalom and realize they do not have to stay hiding. Mm-hmm. Amen. Uh-huh. And they're sitting there. They're like, what? <laughs> Which, yeah. just one thing I want to point out. I don't think Jesus looks over there, right? No, no, yeah. he didn't. Right? No, no he, just, that, he just knows. He's the all-knowing. Yeah, yeah. He's, just, he's just the omniscient creator of the universe who is dwelling in a human form, right? Yeah. That, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't think he never looks over. Yeah, he, he just he knows that they're there, yeah. right? And so he just he, he acknowledges that. And that's his kind of way of breaking the ice, being like, hey, you know, hey, I included you in my prayer. Uh-huh. Uh, and I thought it's funny because, you know, he's being serious, he's being reverent, but he's also being playful at the same time. You know, right. I was like, okay, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he starts making these funny noises, mm-hmm. right? I, I, don't, I don't even know what noises he was making. Yeah, uh, yeah. But they're actually really funny. Like, just, I would love to just get, like, a cut of him making noises because it was actually entertaining. And then he's like, hmm, what's that sound I hear? Uh-huh. Hmm, is that a sheep? Sheep don't sound like that. Yeah. Mm, maybe a rooster. And then he just walks up to them. He's like, greetings, children. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually a really funny scene. It was. And, you know, I have no problem with that. You know, I feel like some people, they might watch that. And they might have a problem with Jesus goofing off like that. I know, yeah. Yeah, which that makes me sad. 
Uh, because, I mean, I don't think we get any scenes in the Bible itself where Jesus is goofing off. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think there are definitely scenes where he's using humor to make a point. Yes. Uh, and I've talked about that in past episodes. I but I don't know. If we, we don't get any scenes of him just, like, totally goofing off. But I definitely think mm-hmm. that he would have, you know? I yeah. mean, he was a human. Yeah. The way that people present God, it really makes seem heaven... Like, it makes it seem like heaven's going to be a really boring place to be. Mm-hmm. Because they basically strip all of the humanity away from God. And I realized, where do you think that you got your sense of humor from? I mean, sure, right. your sense of humor might be corrupted by your sinfulness. Mm-hmm. But, like, you realize that we're created in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, that, you know, the th- the fact that you find things funny, that means God's got to find something funny. Yeah. Right? You didn't yeah. just create that out of nothing. Mm-hmm. Yes, it might be corrupted because you're a sinful creature who finds sinful things funny, but that sense of humor comes from somewhere. Right. right? And so a lot of people, they might get offended by, like, you know, portraying Jesus as this human, but he was that human, right? That's the whole point. Fully God, mm-hmm. fully man. How does it work? I don't know, but it's what the Bible teaches. Mm-hmm. Right? And so I love that he's just like, you know, he's interacting with these kids. He's making funny noises, and they love it, right? It yeah. immediately breaks the ice, and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, this is cool. Yeah, this is a, this is a cool guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially because uh, we have to realize that their culture was vastly different than our culture. Right. Uh, nowadays, our culture and how we value children is a result mainly of Jesus' teaching about children. Mm-hmm. That's something that few people know. Right? And nowadays, sometimes we almost value children too highly uh, right. to where we, we become a little bit too overprotective of them in many ways. Uh, but back in the like cultures like this, you were more highly valued the older you got until you became like useless to society. Uh, so an older person, you know, they were wise and they can contribute to society, whereas kids, they couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. All they were, you know, they were living in your house, stealing your food, not working for it. Yeah. Uh, so children weren't as highly valued. But Jesus, he has this, like, he has a lot of teachings about children. Right. Uh, not not a lot of them, but he's, the, the things that he does say are significant enough. And the things he teaches, teaches you to value children differently as well. Uh, and so I think this is totally fitting with Jesus' character that he would interact with these kids this way. Yes. And he's just goofing off with them. And I just think that was really cool. Uh, I feel like this was more of an obligatory thing that they had to do given our current culture. Uh, but Jesus warns them. He says, hey, by the way. It's kind of dangerous to be wandering around. Uh, there might be some dangerous men out here. You probably shouldn't just be hanging around. Don't worry. I'm not a dangerous man. Yeah. But you might need to watch out for that. Uh, I think they probably just put that in there because of our current culture. You Gotta give that it. clarification. Yeah. Disclaimer. Stranger danger. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I feel like they did that more for us than uh, actually for the uh, kids in the scene. Yeah. Uh, but he warns them about wandering around. He tells them that he's safe. Uh, and then he tells Abigail that it was smart for her to bring a friend this time, mm-hmm. and he offers them some food, right? So mm-hmm. the food that she'd wanted to take before, he's like, hey, have some. She's like, ah, oh, see, I told you he was a good guy. Uh-huh. Didn't I tell you, Joshua? And then Abigail, being her Abigail self, yeah. she starts rapid-firing some questions at Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. It's like 20 questions with the Son of God. Uh, because <laughs> she just like starts like throwing these questions at him. She's like, where are you from? He's like, I am from Nazareth. She says, are you a carpenter? And he says, ah, I'm a craftsman, which... And that seems like a subtle detail, but it's actually very interesting, mm-hmm. right? Uh, there's actually this whole history behind that little comment there. Right. Um, because typically, if you ask somebody what was Jesus' job, they'd say a carpenter, mm-hmm. right? That's typically what we think. Uh, but the Greek word technon most literally means just craftsman. So Jesus could have, he, he probably was a carpenter, mm-hmm. but he probably didn't just work with wood. He probably worked with metal and stone as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably he worked more likely with stone because if you go down to Israel, uh, you'll see that there's a lot more stone to work with than there is wood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he, he was more likely just a craftsman and carpentry was probably part of it, but not like the primary part. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most translations will translate it as carpenter. And so I, I think it was like they put both of those in there. Yeah. Kind of like as a tease. Kind of like what they did with Mary Magdalene in episode one. Right. Where traditionally we consider Mary Magdalene to be a prostitute, but the Bible never actually says that. The Bible, all it tells us is that she had demons cast out of her. And they kind of played both of those, right? They're like, okay, so we need to have the demon thing, but we're also going to hint at her being a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Right? So right here, they're like, oh, are you a carpenter? Well, I'm a craftsman. It's not a big deal, right? It doesn't matter what Jesus was, if he was a carpenter or whatnot. But I can guarantee you, if they said, are you a carpenter? And he said, yes, there would be somebody out there. There would be someone who was like, no, he wasn't. He was a craftsman. But then if they had presented Jesus as working with stone. There had been somebody who like, you know, grew up thinking Jesus was a carpenter. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, this is challenging my entire belief system, which mm-hmm. it shouldn't. But they're, they're giving it to both crowds, right? They're saying, right. he was a carpenter, also a craftsman. Boom. Now you can't complain. So then she says, okay, uh, 
Like, do you travel? He says, yeah, I do travel. But he doesn't make money when he travels. He trades things for food and clothing, right? So they're like, how do you make money? He's like, well, um, I don't actually make this stuff to make money. I actually make this and I trade it for food. And that's just, once again, just like a cultural thing where they're just teaching you, mm -hmm. how did this all work out? And I thought it was a little detail. And Joshua, he doesn't want to ask any questions. Right? Yeah, he's, he's a little he's, nervous. Yeah, he's a little bit nervous. He's like, this guy, I don't know him. This is weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's just more reserved. Uh, but he will come out of his box. Don't worry. Uh, and then Abigail, she says that her family isn't wealthy, and Jesus says that many times that is better. She shows him the doll her mother made her, and then they depart while Jesus is laughing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I like that little detail there. Me too. Right? Uh, just Me It's too. very subtle, uh, but she says, you know, my family's not wealthy. And I like that he points out, you know, sometimes that's better. Mm -hmm. Because especially in America, uh, especially, I mean, right now, just so you know, for context, we are filming this on January 6, 2021. If you don't know what happened on that day, just go look it up in the news. Especially in America, mm -hmm. we can get in this mindset where we think God has blessed us. And whenever we think of blessing, we think purely in terms of like monetary gain or something like that. Yes. So we will say, oh, God is really blessing my business uh, whenever that business is doing really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll say, oh, man, things aren't going very well in my business whenever it's going under. Right. Um, and we'll say, oh, man, God has really just blessed me this year whenever things are going well. You know, God's really blessing our marriage whenever things are just super healthy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we think basically we kind of conflate blessing to the American dream where we think, OK, if things are going good for me, that means that God's blessing me. Yes. Whereas in the Bible, uh, you know, it says consider yourself blessed whenever you suffer. Yep. You know, consider yourself be because, yeah, count it joy whenever you're suffering, because that means that God is blessing you by having your faith tested. Right. Uh, and so really in America, we have this like very incorrect view that, you know, where we basically have conflated God's blessing to the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a best life now mentality. Mm -hmm. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Right. right? And, and so I think it's very, just a very small thing there where he says, you know, it's actually probably better sometimes if you're not wealthy. And you see that, right? Whenever we live in this culture uh, where you have everything you want, even for me, right? As I'm sitting here, I have the luxury of sitting next to you with this lit up bookshelf in a room with mm. air conditioning, looking into a camera, talking about a TV show I like. Right. That being said, there's a lot of distractions that can really distract me from God. Yep. Right. My goal is ministry and I really want to glorify God with my life. But man, living in this luxurious life, there are so many distractions that can just like take me away from it. Yes. Whereas whenever you have less. Sometimes it's easier for you to focus on God because mm -hmm. whenever you have less things to distract you, you can really focus on him and you have to rely on him more. Right. Yes. Uh, whenever we have this luxurious life, it's so easy to focus on the pleasures of life mm -hmm. and the riches that we have and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I like that little detail. Jesus is like, you know, sometimes we would think, oh, man, I'm, I'm so poor. And he's like, no, that's that's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? Uh, because you're poor, you're having to go out and have fun and you stumbled across my camp. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're rich... You might have just been wouldn't out there. Be yeah, you probably wouldn't be going to have fun by the stream playing with this little doll. Yeah. And you probably wouldn't be impressed by Carpenter's Tools. What do you think about the episode so far? Because I've kind of just talked a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything that you want to comment about any of this so far? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> I think you've, cool. you've covered it all for the yeah, most part so far. <laughs> yeah, I tend to talk. So uh, next thing you know, we see Jesus at nighttime once again. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's looking at, I guess it was like a little box that he created. Oh, the lock and key. Uh, oh, it was, I forgot. Yes, yeah. he did. He specified to them it was lock and key. Yeah, and so he looks at the lock and key, and do you know what he says when he looks at it? Uh, it's all good or something like he that. He says, or it is good. Yeah, he says, yeah. it is good. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was a little subtle reference because if you go back to Genesis 1, uh, God creates the heavens and the earth, and whenever he creates uh -huh. something, what does he say? It is good. It's good. Uh, yeah. And so I was like, ah, that's funny because uh -huh. this is Jesus, and yes, he's a man, but. He's also the same person who says it is good back at creation. Right. And so, of course, whenever he creates a lock and key, it's going to be the best dang lock and key you ever yep. did see. Yeah. And he's like, it is good. And then we cut to the next morning, and Jesus is waking up to a bunch of kids standing over him. Yeah. And he jokes around. He's like, oh, guys, couldn't you have waited another half hour? Uh -huh. What did you think about this scene? Yeah. Um, well, that was a whenever she finally brought a more, bunch of kids. Yeah. yeah, more friends. That was... That was exciting because she's bringing more people and then, mm -hmm. you know, that brings back the whole childlike faith. But I think it was also funny that, you know, like, he's like, oh, I'm so tired. Like, mm -hmm. why would you wake me up? Like, are you really? Are yeah. you? Are you really? But, yeah. No, I mean, I bet he probably was. I mean. Probably so. He's, like, I think, once again, they're just showing the humanity of Jesus where he's yeah. waking up. He's like, ugh. So yeah. groggy. I will say this, though. Uh, when we're coming talking about historical context, mm -hmm. I don't think a person like Jesus would have been sleeping in. 
And especially even what we know about him in the Gospels. Uh, right. We read about places where, like, he stays up late praying and then he wakes up early praying. Right. Uh, and that was just a practice of, especially Jewish rabbis or just, like, you know, devout Jews. Mm-hmm. They would wake up early in the morning and start praying. So I don't think that, like, I think he would have been up before it was daylight. Yeah. Uh, before the but, kids would have been up. And yeah. Been able to travel all the way over there and everything. Yeah, but that's not too necessary because I get what they were going for. They were trying to make Jesus more relatable. Uh, but yeah, so he wakes up and he's like, guys, can you all wait another half hour? And then they're like, oh, we just want to know, like, can we hang out with you today? And he's like, hey, I've got some work to do. So if you're going to hang out with me, you're going to have to do some of the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I thought that was kind of cool. I thought it was kind of a cool little detail, like him inviting them to, like, rather than making it... Like, a task, like, oh, well, if you want to hang around me, you got to do my stuff. Yeah. It's almost like he's giving them an opportunity to work alongside him. When we're talking about discipleship, that's exactly how discipleship works. Discipleship is like living life alongside one another in a way that leads to godly living. Mm -hmm. Jesus is doing that with these kids. He's saying, okay, I'm going to do this. You're going to do it with me. And as we see, he's teaching them how to glorify God throughout all of this. Because we're going to see him singing psalms with them right. and teaching them throughout all of this, right? He's doing carpentry. They're doing carpentry. He's going fishing. They're going fishing. But through all of this, he's teaching them how to make their lives revolve around God. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's discipleship. These are the proto-disciples, the uh, the yeah. proto-12, uh-huh, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, so Jesus says they can hang around as long as they help him with his work. And then he says he's going to stick around until it's time for him to go. Because they're asking, like, how long are you around here? Now everybody's starting to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has work to do and people to meet, and he will know the right time. Uh, This is a lot of callbacks to, like, the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus Mm. just, like, you know, he's on this timetable, right? And he's like, okay, i got certain places to go, certain people to see. I'll know the right time to go to those places Mm -hmm. and to meet those right people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the kids ask him, like, are you dangerous? And he says, maybe to some, but no, not to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really like that line uh, because it is 100% accurate. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of, uh, if y'all have ever read, you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, right? Mm-hmm. I've seen the movies. Oh, you've yeah, seen the movies. Uh, I think the line's in the movies, too. But it's in one of the movies, and it's in the books, where they're asking, like, ooh, is Aslan a tame lion? And mm-hmm. they're like, no, Aslan is not a tame lion. Mm-hmm. But he's a good lion. He s- says something along those lines. Tell me about what you're... What are you thinking at this point of the episode? I'm going to look this line up. Yeah, so whenever the kids are asking questions... I know I wrote it down. I have notes on my on my yeah. phone, too. Um Whenever he's talking with the kids, which I don't think we've gotten to the part where they're all, like, sitting down in a circle or whatever, and they're all talking. No, not yet. We haven't gotten there yet. But this is kind of the beginnings of it. Anytime he has questions, he always has the right answer. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun to see how he can immediately just answer these questions right off the top of his head, and they're always just, like, the perfect answer. You're like, I couldn't think of something better. Like, you answered it in the perfect way to where, like, you couldn't really rebuke it. It's like, yeah, that's like the perfect way. Like, I couldn't, couldn't yeah. think of a better way to do it. Classic Jesus movie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And a lot of times, his answer is kind of how we were saying. It's something that, at face value, would make sense to the kids. Mm-hmm. But then, from the audience perspective, and people that, you know, like, we have this entire Bible to reference to, we see how it's, like, scripture is hidden within the answers. Yeah. Which I think is really cool. Because at face value, the kids are like, whenever he asks... Um, like, who provides for you? And he's like, my my father provides everything mm-hmm. for me. It's like, oh, yeah. From our perspective, it's like, oh, yeah, his father's God. But to them, it's just like, oh, is your father rich? Like, yeah, yeah, so, that's funny, think, yeah. But it's all of those questions. They're all structured that way. And I think that's so smart. Yeah, so see, smart. that's even funny. Like, that's even noticing stuff I didn't even notice. Because sometimes knowing scripture can, like, almost distract you from it. Mm-hmm. Because when I heard my father provides for me, I immediately thought, oh yeah, God provides for him. And mm-hmm. then later on, whenever they're like, is your father rich? I was like, that's a random question. And yeah. then like, I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I found the quote. Okay. The quote I was talking about, uh, whenever they ask him, are you dangerous? He says, oh, maybe to some, but not to you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe mm-hmm. where I think they're talking to Mr. Beaver and... Uh, they're talking about Aslan, right? And they say, Aslan, he's a lion. Oh, um, is he safe? Like, is, is he quite safe? Mm-hmm. And they said, whoa, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. Mm-hmm. But he's good. He's the king. Mm-hmm. Right? And I've always loved that line because it's like, no, Aslan's not safe. Mm-hmm. He's terrifying. Mm-hmm. But he's good. Yeah. And that's exactly like, that's Jesus, right? That's God. Like, God, he's a great and mighty and terrible God. And when I say terrible, I'm not meaning like, bad. That's what we made the word mean. I'm talking about like King James version, terrible, like awesome. Mm -hmm. God is amazing and awesome God. We should tremble before him, but he's good. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we fear him, but we love him. Right. And so Jesus, he's like, yeah, I'm dangerous to some, but not to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Y'all, y'all are fine. Mm -hmm. But to some, they better watch out. 
Right. And so that's one of those things we don't really see Jesus get angry in this season, but whenever he just made that comment, I was like, oh yeah, it's coming. He's this serious. Is good. This is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he says, no, I'm not dangerous to y'all. Uh, mm-hmm. They say, do you have a house? He says, my father provides everything I need. That's what you were talking yes. about. Uh, and that just kind of brought me, that brought back some more John 4 vibes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like the word vibes, but it brought back some John 4 vibes whenever <laughs> the disciples were like, hey Jesus, we got that food you wanted. He's like. I have, I have food, food you know not of, of yeah. right? And I was like, Jesus, it's a simple question. All they wanted to know was, do you have a house? And he had to make it theological. Yeah. But uh, that's a classic Jesus move. So, you know, I was like, ah, it's consistent with this mm-hmm, character. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he starts, this is where he starts calling Joshua, Joshua the Brave. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, because Joshua starts speaking up more. Uh-huh. And I like that little detail, you know, Jesus, like, you know, giving people like little nicknames. Yeah. Uh, is, which, yeah. Uh, for a guy named, like Joshua, you know, who was obviously nervous going in. Like, that's probably the most meaningful thing that an adult figure could do, Mm -hmm. right? Call him Joshua the Brave. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's a little bit timid. And just thinking from, like, like how adults relate to children and stuff. And, like, the reason why he's kind of quiet is probably because he's nervous being around this adult. Uh But then to have this, like, you know, obviously this very confident man and stuff, like, say, like, call you Joshua the Brave. Mm -hmm. It probably it probably makes you braver, Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Like, just little details. I was like, you know, that's, that's so subtle. But... That's that's how you that's how you treat a child. Mm-hmm. Like if you're actually wanting to develop a relationship with this child, that's what you do. You know, call him Joshua the Brave. And he's like, yes, I am brave. I am brave. <laughs> you're right. Uh, and so they, he starts asking like, "What's your favorite food?" And Jesus, of course, says like bread. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I thought that was kind of lame because that's like the expected response. I was hoping he was going to say like pomegranates. Yeah. I was like, oh, that, like that was going to be kind of funny to me. But he's like, I like bread because it's got a certain. There's many things. There are many reasons why I like bread. I'm like, uh-huh. of course, John chapter 6, bread of life. I get it, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but it was good. Uh, and then he asked the kids if they know the Shema, mm-hmm. right? And the Shema, that is probably um, the most common Jewish prayer. And it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, where we receive like the greatest commandment and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, this is what they begin to recite to him. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts and on your house and on your gates. Right? And so they start reciting this. And of course, every Jewish child would know this prayer, mm-hmm. right? This is the most common Jewish prayer because it is like, you know, it, it's the Shema. The word Shema, it's literally just the Hebrew word like that starts off the whole thing, hear. Right. To hear is Shema. Um, so hear, O Israel. And I absolutely love this scene mm-hmm. because Jesus asks them, and then what happens here is I think music starts playing mm-hmm. and they're reciting it. And as they're reciting this, the camera just kind of pans to Jesus. Yes. And it just focuses on him. Mm-hmm. And he's like getting teary-eyed. As he listens to that, right? Mm -hmm. And like every time I just get chills. And it's like, oh, it's so good. What did you think about the scene? Yeah, I was, you could see almost how taken back he was. And almost, I'm not going to say humbled because I mean, he's Jesus. But like you could see the raw emotion in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that was just, that was super awesome. I felt it and I was like, you know, just watching it on a TV screen. So I can only imagine like trying to put myself in his shoes Mm -hmm. And seeing all these kids surrounding him and knowing it by memory mm-hmm. and, you know, praising God and everything, that is, that's just awesome. Well, yeah, because it's like literally, yes, this is a man, but this is the God who said these words, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And he said this to Israel and he commanded them, teach this to your children, mm-hmm. right? Like that's literally in there. It says, teach this to your kids. Put it everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. Put it over your head. Put it on your arm. And they took that very literally, yeah. right? And he says, teach these words. Love the Lord your God. All these things, right? And so I just love that scene because it just pans to Jesus. And he's getting visibly, like, choked up. Mm -hmm. Hearing, like, his own words being Mm -hmm. recited by the mouths of these children. Mm -hmm. And just that that scene, the way it captures, I'm like, man, that's beautiful. Uh, I hope that that's how God reacts whenever, you know, we praise him and worship him. I Mm -hmm. hope that that's how he's reacting right now as we're Mm -hmm. making this video talking Mm -hmm. about him, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought it was just a beautiful representation of that uh, because, you know, whenever you go to the Old Testament and you have God talking about the sacrifices that Israel is to make, um, to us, those sacrifices sound really ghastly and gross. But whenever God describes them, he says, these are like a pleasing aroma to me. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the it's imagery, obviously, you know, God's not saying he's got a nose, like, but he's, he's right. saying, like, the imagery is that it's like a sweet smell, like whenever you smell like the sweetest candle or, you know, we all have those different aromas that we just really like. Mm-hmm. He says that's what it's like whenever you offer your worship. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm thinking of whenever, like, he hears these kids reciting the Shema and he's just, like, looking at all of them. And they all, like, none of them stutter through it, right? Yeah. All of them know it just by heart because they've said it every morning, every evening. And he just listens. And it's just, it's a very moving scene to me. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love that scene just because just the way it's portrayed. I'm like, wow, this, like, I could believe this is the God of the universe mm-hmm. reacting to children reciting his own words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like very, very well acted, very well done. Absolutely. Um, and once again, not something I would have thought. Like, if yeah. I was creating the show, I would not have thought to do that. Yeah. But I'm really glad they included it. Uh, and then he starts talking to them some more, and he says, My home is in many places because I have a much larger job than being a teacher. And this is where we start moving into him kind of preaching to them more, right? right? And he says, Everybody has a much larger job than just their trade. And you are more than just students. You are at school to show love to one another and to date God's word and to share it and at your home to honor your father and mother and most important from all, from the law of Moses... To love the Lord your God with all your heart. Mm -hmm. Right? So he hears them recite the Shema. And then what he does is he takes that and he applies it. Right? right? Because that's what you're supposed to do with scripture. You're not supposed to just emptily recite it. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to take it Mm -hmm. and apply it in your life. And he says, so you just said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You want to know how you do that? Well, let me explain how I do it in my life. Mm -hmm. And then I'll explain how you do it in yours. I go around everywhere because I have a much bigger job than just being a craftsman. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, you a much bigger job than just being a student, right? right? Whenever you go to school, you're supposed to love the people around you. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to glorify God by learning his word and sharing it with the world. Mm -hmm. And when you're at home, you're supposed to honor your parents, right? That goes back to um, like the Ten Commandments, right? The Fifth Commandment, honor your mother and father. It's the first commandment with a promise. It'll go well with you, right? And so really cool. Like I, I like how seamless it is. Yes. Right? Because we've talked a lot about this in recent shows we've watched where people try to deliver a message and it gets like overly preachy. Right. Uh, to where it's like, I don't mind if a show preaches at me. Uh, especially if it's a Christian show, right? But oh, yeah. I don't mind if a show preaches at me if they've got a message to get across. Mm-hmm. But I want it to be a smooth transition to where it feels believable and it doesn't take me out of the show. Yes. The way they do this, it's so believable, right? Absolutely. Jesus is just talking with these kids mm-hmm. and he says, do y'all know the Shema? They say it, and he gets so moved that he's like, well, let me explain to you what I meant by that. Mm-hmm. Right? He doesn't tell them what I meant, right? But yes. uh, he, he just begins to explain it to them. And I'm just like, that's really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how we should be as well, right? We shouldn't just quote scripture. We should know what is meant by that scripture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jesus does a lot in explaining to us mm-hmm. what's meant by scripture, right? There's a lot of times where, uh, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, he'll say, you've heard it said this way. But let me tell you what that really means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you keep quoting that verse. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so then, uh, after this, we cut to the kids. And they're now walking away. And they're speculating about who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them are saying, wow, maybe he's stronger than Samson. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're just guessing about it. Uh, maybe he's a teacher in the synagogue. And then this one, like, cute little girl, yeah. she comes out. And she's, like, the youngest one there. But they gave her, like, the most, like, the biggest mouthful of line. Oh, because yeah, yeah. Because she's, like, the smartest one, too. Because she's, like, maybe he's a prophet who will show us the word of God. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, like, wow. Wow, on the nose. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, wow, you, you really knew that. Yeah. But then, of course, they immediately dismiss it. They're, like, no. There are no more prophets. Rabbi Josiah told us. Uh-huh. And that's what they thought at the time. Right. right. I mean, there was, to be fair, in Deuteronomy, Moses promised that there would be a prophet to come who was like him. So they were still waiting for that prophet. Mm-hmm. But whenever you read, like, the, the Apocrypha, uh, you read books like the Maccabees and stuff like that uh, in the Apocrypha, in those books, they admit that there were no prophets around at this time. That's why I'd say they're not inspired, right? Because they admit, they're like, hey, uh, there's no prophets. And in order for something to be the word of God, it had to be written by a prophet. But yeah, the, the, during this time period, during those 400 silent years between the Old and New Testament, there were no prophets around. Mm-hmm. And so that's why Rabbi Josiah is saying there are no prophets. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, the girl, the one girl, she's like, right on there. She's like, maybe he's a prophet sent to teach us the word of God. And they're like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, it's like all the other ones were wrong. Maybe he's a prophet. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh no, that, she was right on the nose. Uh, then they started debating, like, oh, maybe he's a murderer. Maybe that's why he's alone. Maybe he's, like, a criminal and he's on the run. And I was like, yeah. okay, that's kind of funny. That is. Uh, and that's when Abigail turns to them, like I mentioned earlier. And she says, no matter what, we mm-hmm. agree that we don't tell anybody about this, all right? Mm-hmm. And they're like, 
okay. And they're like, shalom, shalom, shalom. Meet you and tomorrow. Like, yeah. yeah. Then we kind of have just like this uh, compilation of just multiple days passing. Yeah. And we get to see that they're spending time with Jesus day after day after day. Mm-hmm. Once again, discipleship is occurring. It's not like multiple days go in between. Mm-hmm. It's like whenever they're available, mm-hmm. they're spending time with Jesus. Yeah. Is there an application there for us? I think so. I think so. Maybe we need to spend less time on YouTube. Yeah. If you're watching this video, I'm calling you out. Maybe we need to spend less time on YouTube and more time with Jesus. Uh-huh. But if you're watching, now let's be honest about movies. Uh, I think that's acceptable because we're teaching you about Jesus. So please like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but the next day, we see them hanging out with Jesus and they're going fishing. And then later we see him going into town and he comes back at night. Mm-hmm. Right? So he leaves with some stuff and he comes back, presumably having like traded some stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just going about doing his job. Right. Right. And then the next day. Uh, they're around the fire and he's teaching them the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is found in Matthew chapter 6. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, he's teaching them all of that. Uh, And so that's kind of cool. Like, there's little references there. Uh, Once again, they're the proto-disciples. I imagine they did the same thing that the disciples did to Jesus. They're like, teacher, teach us how to pray. And he's Mm -hmm. like, when you pray, pray like this. Mm -hmm. So just little references there. And that evening, we actually see him dressing a wound. Right, yes. so uh, we don't know how he got the wound, but once again, he's a man. I know. I and like so he injured also. himself. And he's like, mm-hmm. ah, and he's like doing that, and then he starts stretching. Right, he's like, oh, just getting uh, getting okay. all the kinks out. You know, yeah. I'm kind of sore. <laughs> uh, which you're a dancer, so I thought that you'd probably find that pretty entertaining because you probably stretch a lot. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? Good, good stretching, Jesus. Good stretching. Good job, good, Jesus. Good job. Good, good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then we move on, and then the next day he's telling them the story. And I don't know if this is the story he was telling them in this scene, but he is telling them a story about two she-bears coming out and, like, attacking oh. people. Mm-hmm. And so you don't really get the whole context, but I'm assuming that he's telling the story about Elisha, mm. or Elisha, I don't care how you pronounce it, uh, from Second Kings chapter 2, where we read, From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, and as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of town and jeered at him. Get out of here, baldy, they said. Get out of here, baldy. Uh, He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Pretty crazy story. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, these people call this guy bald and he's like, boom, bears. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so I don't know if that is what he was telling them about. I just know he mentioned two bears. He did say she bears, though. And I don't know. I'd have to look into the original languages to see if there's any implication those bears are female. I have to look into that, but... That's just, I mean, he could have just been telling them some other random story. I don't know. I was just trying to see if there was anything biblical about that, and that's Mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, But they were laughing at it, so I could assume that that's probably the story because it's actually a pretty funny story. Yeah. Uh, But, you know, something to think about also. Uh, Don't call somebody bald. It's not very nice. Then we cut to another day, right? Um, Well, first off, we get to see him at nighttime praying once again, and he's nervous and he's shaking. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. cool. And then another day, uh, now he's leading them in a song, uh, in a song. Which mm-hmm. is also a song, right? He's saying, Behold how good and how pleasing. And then they repeat after him. Mm-hmm. If brothers could sit together in unity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's actually Psalm 133. I'm looking down at my phone so much because I'm trying to also pull up the scriptures as I'm talking here. Uh, and so Psalm 133, it's actually only three verses long. And it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. You know, it's just talking about how good it is whenever, like, the people of God get along with one another. Um, You know, that's something that maybe the modern church needs to hear as well. We need to fight for unity. Come on, guys. Uh, Let's just go around and we'll sing the same song, kind of like Jesus teaching these children. Uh, But once again, they're just doing casual stuff, hanging out with one another, being around a campfire, and he's teaching them how to sing. Right? Like, he's showing them how to live a life that revolves around God. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, so often we kind of just compartmentalize God into like, okay, I'm going to church on Sunday, going to church on Wednesday, Absolutely. doing this, doing that. Jesus right here is showing them literally every aspect of your life mm-hmm. can revolve around God. Mm-hmm. Right, you can be hanging around a campfire and you're just singing songs. Right, you're singing mm-hmm. the psalms of your people. 
right? That's really cool. I like just how subtle it is, yeah. but also how non-subtle it is, right? It's very over the top, and it's really encouraging you to a life that is, like, consumed yeah. by the glory of God. Mm-hmm. But that's what we want, right? God deserves that. He gave us everything. We deserve to give him everything. Uh, mm-hmm. We owe it to him to give him everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we see them walking away and talking excitedly. And then, this is where we cut to the scene you were talking about, and this where if you look at my phone screen, like, man, I've got so many notes on this scene, because this is really the good portion of the rest of the episode. Right. This is the first scene I ever saw of the whole show. Mm -hmm. This is the scene where they are gathered under the tree, and they're talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, So before I go on my long rant and talk, what did you think about this scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I know how we were talking about earlier, the tension between divinity and humanity, Um, I think that this scene is what really kind of brings the entire episode together Mm -hmm. because leading up to this, you have times where he's, you know, referencing scripture, you know, they're seeing Psalms and things like that. So it definitely is theologically sound and he is incorporating those things, but we also see a lot of personality from him, which is good, which Mm -hmm. I I do appreciate. But then I think by having this moment, that's when you really bring in that balance and bring that divinity back into the episode. Mm -hmm. So it's not too much humanity that bringing that back in. And now I think that's what really balances out the entire episode, which I really liked. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and this ep- uh, just this whole scene right here, yeah. I know they're filming the Sermon on the Mount for season two. Mm-hmm. This gets me really excited for the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Because just how this whole scene was filmed, I could listen to Jonathan Rumi playing Jesus, teaching the words of God for mm-hmm. hours. That was so good. <laughs> because how he does so it and how, and how it just like it interweaves together with people asking questions and like the teaching just flows out of it. Very well done, Mm -hmm. and I just loved it. And and I really like how it's with kids, right? I just think that's so funny because uh, I would have never thought about that once again. But it's just, it's beautiful how this works out. Like, this is nothing, none of this comes from the Bible, Mm -hmm. but it all lines up with how Jesus treats kids in the Bible, and it all lines up with Jesus' character and Jesus' teachings. And I love all of that. And so it gets me really excited for the Sermon on the Mount because mm-hmm. I'm excited to see how they do that. I'm actually really jealous because in about a month they're filming it here in Texas, but up yeah. in Dallas. And apparently if you paid a certain amount of money and like donating to them, you actually get to be an extra in that scene. And I'm like, oh, if only I had enough money to do that. But uh-huh. currently I am a seminary student who is broke. So uh-huh. <laughs> unfortunately I'm just going to keep making these YouTube videos until I have more than 50 subscribers and maybe one day... <laughs> Uh, some money, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and then I'll be able to be in the Sermon on the Mount when they remake the show in 30 years. <laughs> uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, so that the next day, finally, they're gathered under a tree and Jesus is teaching them. And one kid, uh, I don't know if we know this kid's name, I don't think we do, but he's recounting how this kid kept pushing him, right? Uh-huh. And he says, yeah, so eventually I just pushed him down. And then Jesus says, well, that's why you got in trouble. Uh-huh. And the kid says, well, hey. Even in the Torah, it says eye for eye, Mm -hmm. right? He's quoting Exodus chapter 21, right? Which is a, it's just a chapter after the Ten Commandments, right? And in Exodus 21, it says, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, you know? And and really the whole point of that is, as Jesus is going to point out, that's for a court of law. Right. Right? So he's saying, yes, uh, whenever it comes to a law, what the Old Testament is clarifying there is that if you're wanting to treat somebody justly, the punishment has to fit the crime. Right. right? So if somebody plucks your eye out, you can't chop their head off. Mm-hmm. Right? If somebody steals your kitten, you can't burn down their house. Mm-hmm. Also, to clarify, it's not even saying you have to do that. Mm-hmm. Right? If somebody plucks your eye out, you could just choose to forgive them. Right? right? That's actually the standard. Right? If you're wanting to love your neighbor as God loves you, that's actually what you do. You just forgive them. Mm-hmm. So the law is not stating you have to do that. It's not like if somebody plucks out your eye, you have to take their eye. Mm-hmm. It's not saying that. It's saying that the punishment cannot be greater than the crime. Right. It's actually, rather than encouraging you to exact justice, it's actually just preventing you from getting undue revenge. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what it's doing. Mm-hmm. It's actually limiting you. That's usually what laws do. Right? Mm-hmm. Laws, they're not trying to give you freedom to just like push the law. It's, no, it's limiting you so that you don't go too far. Uh, so that's what God's doing there in Exodus 21. He's saying, hey, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But this kid quotes that. He's like, hey, this kid was pushing me, so I knocked him to the ground. And that's what the Torah says. It says eye for eye. And Jesus says, my friend. <laughs> my friend. That's in a court of law. This was hardly. This was hardly a court of law. Right? You. And then he points to all of them. He says, you all are supposed to be special. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to act differently that others act, mm-hmm. right? And this, to me, uh, really this whole teaching, this is why I said I got excited about the Sermon on the Mount, uh-huh. because a lot of the things that he teaches here 
uh, to these kids is very similar. You can tell they're inspired by the Sermon on the Mount. Because in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually references the eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing. Mm -hmm. Matthew 5, 38, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So what Jesus is saying there, he's not saying to just let people stomp on you. But what he's saying is that you should show people grace. Right. Right. If somebody does something to you, don't don't hold it against them. Right. Realize that they're sinners uh, just like you are. Right. And so if they did something against you, that's an opportunity to show them grace. If they slap you, it's all right. Turn the other cheek. That's not saying like saying like, hey, slap me again. It's saying, no, I'm just going to I'm not going to hold it against you. Right. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That, sometimes we take that out of context. It's like, oh, uh, slap me on this side. Right. Uh-huh. Somebody sues you. Oh, here, have my tunic, too. No, what he's saying, don't hold it against them. Kill them with kindness, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if somebody does this for you, be giving to them. Don't hold it against them. Maybe they need it. Right. <laughs> Uh, if, they're, if they're being harsh against you, that doesn't merit you being harsh against them. What you should do is you should act as God acts towards us. Even whenever we rebel against him, he's still gracious and loving to us. Mm-hmm. That's how we should act to people, right? Even if they're our enemies and even if they're persecuting us and even if they're attacking us, which we don't face that a whole lot right now, right? Once again, if you're sitting there watching this on YouTube, you're probably not going through as much as you think you're going through. Uh, you might be. You might be. I don't want to discount that. But most likely... If you were going through something tough, you would not be sitting down watching an hour-long thing of us breaking down an episode of a show. Jesus is saying, hey, whenever things don't go your way, you have an opportunity there, mm-hmm. right? You could react as the world reacts, and you could say eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That is justice. You can do that. Mm-hmm. But you also have this opportunity to show people the love of God, and you can be gracious to them. Mm-hmm. And if they slap you, guess what? You cannot hold it against them. Turn the other cheek, right? If they sue you and they demand one thing from you, Give them more than they ask, right? That's what Jesus does. That's what God does, right? All we ask is that he would leave us alone because we wanted to do our own thing. He says, okay, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm actually going to send my son to die for you even though you don't deserve it, right? So that's exactly what God does with us. And so that's what Jesus is teaching this kid. He's saying, hey, I get where you're going from. This isn't a court of law, though. So don't do that. You have an opportunity to live differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I did really like that. And you, all of you, you're supposed to be special. You're supposed to act differently than others. And then Joshua, Joshua the brave, he speaks Mm -hmm. up and he says, You tell us to be gentle, but Rabbi Josiah tells us the Messiah will lead us against the Romans. That he will be a great military leader. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is probably the first time in this show so far where they've really addressed the idea of how people viewed the Messiah at this time. Right. And there was no singular view of how they viewed the Messiah. But the prevalent view was this, right? The the prevalent view was that the Messiah, when he showed up, was going to be a military leader who would show up and just kick out the Romans, Mm -hmm. right? Some people might have disagreed with that, but by and large, that was the perspective. And whenever you read the Old Testament, uh, I just finished reading the Old Testament, like, what, two days ago? Yeah, Yeah, no, yesterday. Yesterday. Literally yesterday. I finished reading it yesterday, and I just got through the prophets, and some of those prophecies, you're reading it, and you're like, yeah. That guy sounds like a military leader. But, as we'll see with Jesus, the first time he comes, that's not his goal. Pragmatically speaking, if he showed up the first time to wipe out evil from the earth, all of us would be wiped out. So what he does the first time, he shows up and he offers us forgiveness for our sins, right? He handles the greater problem, which is our sin, so that we have time to repent and get things right before him. So when he comes back the second time to wipe out evil, we're right before our creator. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, If he came out and just did what they wanted him to do the first time, there would be no citizens in the kingdom of God. But thankfully, that's not what he did. And he didn't give us what he wanted. So sometimes we need to realize that the best thing God can do is not give us what we desired. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Joshua, he's confused because he's like, uh, Rabbi Josiah told us the Messiah is going to be a military leader. So what's up with that? Because you're telling us to be gentle. Uh, The Messiah is going to be different, right? Uh, And this is where I liked how Jesus answered this. Mm -hmm. Because uh, just the way that they set this up, you know, This kid is voicing the opinion of somebody he highly respects. Right. And I was thinking, man, it's not going to be very good if Jesus just like says like, ah, (laughs) Rabbi Josiah is an idiot. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't do that. He says, you know, it's important to respect your elders. And it's also important to honor your parents. And Rabbi Josiah, he's a very smart man. But you have to realize that sometimes even very smart men can be wrong. 
And so I liked how they even set that up because, like, he gave respect to them and he wasn't just, like, putting thoughts in their head that would cause them to discredit Rabbi Josiah in the future. Mm -hmm. He said, Rabbi Josiah, he's a smart man, but even smart men can be wrong. Uh, And so I I thought it was a very good and gentle way how he handled that. Right. Uh, Very, um, I wish that I had that much uh, (laughs) subtlety and gentleness sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so he says, is there anything in scripture that says the Messiah will be a great military leader? And this is the one place, like, if there's any place in The Chosen so far where I've had any questions, it'd probably be that question that he asked right there. Mm. Mainly because, like I said, I just finished reading The Prophets, and there are definitely places where Scripture seems to imply that the Messiah will be a great military leader. Mm -hmm. It says, like, hey, he's going to show up, and your king is going to wipe out all these foreign nations. Uh, So, yes, I do think that Scripture teaches that. I do think that the Jews at the time conflated it and they were too specific on how they thought that was going to take place. Mm -hmm. But I do think that is a promise because I do still believe that Jesus is coming back one day and when he comes back, he is going to wipe out the people who are opposed to God. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think, yes, he is a military leader. Uh, So that was the one place where I was kind of like, I don't really know there because Jesus is like, is there anywhere? I'm like, yeah, yeah, there is. But I got what they were going for for the show. But even like out of all eight episodes of the first season, that was like literally the only place where I'm just like, mm. I mean, I don't know. Maybe in future episodes, I'll find some other stuff. But yeah. that was the one thing I was like, well, yeah, the, the scripture does say that he's going to be a military leader, but it doesn't imply when he's going to be a military leader. Mm-hmm. Right. And as we see, it's not the first time. The first time he's coming more as a suffering servant. Right. Uh, Then we move on, and he tells them that they have time to learn and not to worry if they don't know all the answers because God doesn't reveal everything at once. And I thought that was, once again, a very good lesson there. Mm -hmm. Right? He says, hey, guys, you have time to learn this stuff. If you don't know all the answers, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we should also encourage people when we're teaching them scripture um, because I don't know all the answers, right? I mean, if I'm waiting until I know all the answers, I'm not going to be able to talk to you about anything until heaven Right? And so you don't have to know all the answers. You just got to realize that God's going to teach you. Uh, God is our father. He is our friend. But he's also our teacher. Mm -hmm. And so he teaches us just slowly and surely. He gives us um, sometimes a little more than we can handle. But that's how a good teacher teaches things. Right? Mm -hmm. teaches us to trust him as well. Uh, But God, he's definitely a teacher. You don't grab a kindergartner and give him a calculus textbook. You teach him basic addition. Right? And then you add in some subtraction, then multiplication, division, algebra, geometry. Eventually you get to calculus. Right. But that you build up there, right? And so I thought that was a good lesson for them. He says, hey, if you don't know everything, that's fine. God doesn't teach you everything at once. You've got time to learn. Y'all are still young and y'all are honestly getting it better than most people do. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you're, good. you're good. Just be patient. He says, but children, what if many of the things our people think about how we are to behave and act are wrong? Mm-hmm. And this is something where I'm not going to linger on this one long, but... It reminded me a lot of Nicodemus, you know, in previous episodes, because this is almost the same thing that Nicodemus is thinking. He's like, what if, what if our entire perspective is wrong? Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, so Jesus is kind of hinting at the same thing, and what he's doing is basically laying the groundwork for them to shift their whole worldview, right? Because he basically just told them, I mean, we, we don't want to discount this. He just said, you know that Messiah guy that people have been waiting for for thousands of years? Mm-hmm. That, that guy who your rabbi has been telling you, like, is going to be this one particular way? He's actually going to be totally different, mm-hmm. you know? So he, he really is shaking the worldview, and he says, what if everything we believe is wrong? Mm-hmm. Like, you've been saying eye for eye, tooth for tooth. What if you're allowed to show grace and mercy to somebody? Mm-hmm. I mean, earlier you're all quoting the Shema, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What if you haven't fully grasped what that means? Mm-hmm. What if it means a little bit more than how y'all are applying it, right? So he's laying the groundwork for this. Very beautiful. And then he says, you want justice. Do you know who else wants justice? And this is one of the most memorable parts of the whole show because this is wherever, you know, he just, like, looks. And he's kind of, like, you know, he just kind of looks up and you're like, ah, you know. Uh, He's like, yeah. (laughs) He's like, my dad likes justice. Uh And after he points up to heaven, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, he looks at them. He says, do you know what the Lord says about vengeance? Mm -hmm. And then this is when Abigail, she sparks up again. And she's like, "Uh, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Right? And that is from Deuteronomy. And we actually have that quoted again whenever we get to Paul writing his letter to the Romans, right? So, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And this is where Jesus, he kind of makes a funny line. He, he kind of laughs. He's like, boys, listen up. She doesn't even go to Torah school. Uh-huh. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny. He, he goes to move on. He says, the Lord loves justice, but maybe it's not ours to handle. Once again, January 6, 2021, very important lesson for us to learn as Christians. 
right? Uh, yes, there's a time for vengeance, but that is not necessarily our business, right. right? We're called to love people and love them graciously and love them not as the world defines love, but love them as God defines love, but also to leave the vengeance to him. Sometimes there might be times where we feel compelled to act, even to defend what seems right. But the Bible might call us to just suffer through the evil, right? That's, that's a hard thing to swallow, especially whenever we have this American Christianity that tells us that blessing equals a good life, like a, a good life from a material standpoint. Right. Um, but no, the Bible says, you know, it's a blessing to suffer sometimes. And so you might want vengeance and you might feel entitled to vengeance, mm-hmm. but it's not the case. Right? No. The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Your job is to love these people and to love them graciously, even if they harm you. Right? And that's what Jesus' message is here. And that's the message of Scripture. Very, very important. He says, The Lord loves justice, but maybe it isn't ours to handle. And then he recounts the story of David sparing Saul from 1 Samuel. This whenever David, he was on the run uh, and Saul's chasing after him. He actually spares Saul twice. Uh, but probably the more popular story that Jesus is alluding to here is whenever David is hiding in a cave. And King Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself, to use the restroom. And David's men tell him, like, hey, this is your chance. Go kill him. And David says, I will not kill the Lord's anointed. Because Saul is a king, right? David's already been anointed to be the future king. But he says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Yeah. But instead of what he does, he goes and he cuts off a piece of Saul's rope. And then Saul leaves. And then David stands and he calls out, Saul! (laughs) And Saul's like, David, what are you doing here? And David's like, I got a piece of your rope. And Saul's like, How'd you do that? And David's like, because I'm a sneaky ninja, that's how. <laughs> but the whole point is that the time was not for vengeance, mm-hmm. right? David showed mercy to Saul because he was the Lord's anointed, right? And so Jesus uses that story. Once again, he's including the Old Testament a bunch here to teach them lessons, which you have to, right? I mean, the New Testament was not written yet. So sure. to teach them, you teach the Old Testament. Uh, and then he says, and God says he will have compassion on his people when? And Abigail raises her hand again, but he says, okay, let's maybe let somebody else answer. Maybe somebody who's been going to school. Uh-huh. Uh, Abigail is basically the Hermione of the Chosen, right? Mm-hmm. She's like the know-it-all uh, who's very zealous, which is really cool. Very encouraging. It's yeah. awesome to see like this little girl who's so passionate. But Jesus is like, hey, give somebody else a chance. Uh-huh. <laughs> we all know those kids in school, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Jesus says, give somebody else a chance. Uh, and so, and God says he'll have compassion on his people when? And then Joshua raises his hand and says, when their strength is gone. And I was actually interested whenever I looked this up because I was wondering, where is that found? That's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 36. Mm-hmm. Do you know what verse it is that says, vengeance is mine? Mm-hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. Nice. Right? So what Jesus is doing here, uh, in two separate little sections here, he's teaching them from the same scripture. Right? right? That's really cool. And that's something that we miss because we don't study the scripture enough. Right? I, I mean, I study the Old Testament a lot, but I wasn't aware of that. But these kids, you know, they're like, oh, yeah. Uh, verse 35 says, vengeance is mine. And then verse 36 says, I will have compassion on your people whenever their strength is gone. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, so what are we supposed to do? Okay, well, we're supposed to trust God to handle the whole vengeance and justice thing. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to just love people until our strength is gone and pray that God will give us compassion whenever that time comes. Yes. You know, and that's cool. I thought it was really interesting how those verses are back to back. Uh, yeah. they, they could have just cherry-picked verses to fit the thing they were trying to teach, but instead they literally just used the context of one passage mm-hmm. to get this whole point across. And I was like, that's really cool. Because I hear the vengeance is mine thing quoted a lot, mm-hmm. but I don't really hear that verse. And I was like, oh, that, that was that was neat. I like that little detail. So he says, so maybe allow God to provide the justice. Maybe we handle these things in a different way, not trying to be the strongest all the time. And they say, even Messiah? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and then I, I do like what he says here. He says, we'll have to see. Uh-huh. Right? He's like, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to spoil that yet. You know, yeah. just stay for episode four. Stay tuned. <laughs> Tune in next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, he says, we'll, we'll have to see what the Messiah will do. But do not expect Messiah to arrive on a tall horse carrying weapons. Mm-hmm. And he will be most pleased with you, those of you who are the peacemakers. I think my accent's getting pretty good, huh? It is. I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing, killing it. You I've, are doing pretty good. I think I've listened to it enough, right? Yeah. Uh, so... We got two things here, right? He says, don't expect the Messiah to show up on this tall horse. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we know, Jesus is going to show up on a lowly donkey, donkey, right? And he's going to ride into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then he says also, he'll be most pleased with you who are the peacemakers, which once again is a reference to the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. Mm -hmm. If you want to know the rest of it, 
go look it up, Matthew yeah. chapter 5. Uh, and then they move on. They say, where were you yesterday? And this is where Jesus kind of gives us a timeline of when this is happening. Right? Because mm-hmm. they say, where were you yesterday? And he says, there was a woman in town who needed my help. And then he tells them it was part of his bigger job, right? Because earlier in the episode, he'd said, yes. I've got a bigger job that goes just beyond being a craftsman. Mm-hmm. And he says, I have called this woman and I'm calling other people to follow me on my journey. Yes. Right? And like, hmm, yes. very ominous, but also interesting. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, so that's back episode one. Right. And so and now really this like what this scene right here is taking place between episodes one and two. Because episode two is like a week after. So you're like, okay, yes. now you're getting an idea of where this all fits. Uh, which is cool because you're wondering, why did Jesus only show up at the end of these episodes? Well, he was hanging out with these kids and teaching them how to love God. Yeah. Right? Classic Jesus. You think that he's doing nothing, but he's... He's doing something. doing something. Absolutely. Yeah. And then he's talking to them about, like, you know, the people that he's calling and stuff. And they say, what if they don't like you? Mm-hmm. And this is where he laughs. And he says, many won't. That's my reason for being here. Mm-hmm. And I like that, too. Like, yeah. I, I like the little things they put in there. Slip in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because th- this is very similar to whenever he had said, I'm dangerous to some, but not yes. to you. You know, he's like, yeah, a lot of people won't like me. And sure enough, yeah, no kidding, people won't like you. I mean, they're going to kill you. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people who don't like him. I like him, um, but if I'm being totally honest with you, I don't know if I would have liked him back then because whenever I read the Bible, I identify a lot more with the Pharisees than I'd like to identify with them, and they didn't like Jesus very much. And so I'm just grateful for the fact that uh, I have about 2,000 years of hindsight to yeah. tell me I should like him. Yes. Uh, but Jesus is like, yeah, no, many people won't like me. Uh, and he doesn't seem that troubled by that. He's like, yeah, it's all right. He's got he's the god of the universe. He's used to people not liking him, right? Uh, being that we literally have all sinned against him, and none of us like submitting to authorities above us. And he's the authority above everything. So, yes. you know, he's used to people not liking him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say, I'm confused. What is your reason for being here? Because he says that, like, he literally just said, many won't like me. That's my reason for being here. Mm-hmm. And they say, I'm confused. What is your reason for being here? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is where he tells them. That he's going to tell them this information because adults need the faith of children, right? And yes. you have Jesus' teachings in the Gospels of, you know, having childlike faith and the necessity of that. Yes. Um, and then he says, this answer is for all of you. Mm-hmm. And what he does is he begins to quote um, a passage in Isaiah that Jesus does also quote in the Gospels, right? And it was actually really cool. I remember, like I said, this is the first scene I ever saw of The Chosen. Right. And I remember I was watching it on YouTube. And whenever they asked him, what is your purpose for going here? My mind immediately went to this passage. Mm-hmm. And I was like, please quote it. Please. Uh-huh. And then, like, you know, I think the music cuts off or maybe it turns up. I don't even remember what happens. But the way it's directed, it's perfect uh-huh. to where he kind of just pauses. And then he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. Uh, interestingly, he stops at the same place where he stops in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. And that's right there. Right? Because in the Gospels, like what happens uh, in that story, Jesus stands up and he unro- unrolls the scroll and he quotes that passage and he says, Truly I tell you, today, right now, this has been fulfilled. And that's obviously a passage about the Messiah. And so right. people get really ticked off and they try to go kill him. Right? Because he literally just said, like, I'm the Messiah. He claimed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they didn't like that. But in both the show and in the Gospels, Mm -hmm. he leaves off one line. uh, Because he says, um, you know, he's come to do all these things and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and then he stops. But Isaiah keeps going. Mm -hmm. And he says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. Because what you realize whenever the Gospels do that, whenever Jesus does it here, is that you get to see that in between those two lines in Isaiah... There's thousands of years. Yes. Because, yes, this is the day of the, or the year of the Lord's favor, right? Jesus comes for the first time to let everybody know that salvation is available for those who believe. Right. But the day of vengeance, that's still yet to come. We are currently in between those two lines in Isaiah. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in the year of the Lord's favor, and now we're awaiting that day of vengeance. And I love how they intersected that with the message that was just taught. Mm-hmm. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And he says, leave the vengeance to God. Yeah. And then he leaves off the day of vengeance thing because he's like, mm-hmm. that's not yet. It all ties together. And so the message to us would be, guess what? You're still waiting that vengeance part. You're waiting for that. So if you have the same temptation these kids had, well, guess what? God's still in control 
and he still will take that vengeance. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came the first time, he came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? Salvation is here. But when he comes a second time, you better watch out uh, because that's when the day of vengeance is coming. Yes. And so I, I really love that he quotes that because that's another place where in the show I get chills because it's like, this is the God of the universe mm. reciting his words yeah. to these children, right? Like it, it's, it's a role reversal. Earlier, they were reciting his it's, words to him, yeah. but now he's like, okay, it's time for me to tell you, mm-hmm. you know, what's my purpose? It's this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really right here, I guess he's kind of proclaimed to these kids that he is the Messiah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, after he finishes saying this, you can see once again, Jesus is getting kind of teary eyed here. He's getting emotional because it's almost like he's been waiting to proclaim these for so long. Right? Yeah. He's been waiting to proclaim these words. And this is whenever Joshua raises his hand and he says, Isaiah. And then Jesus just nods his head and he says, Isaiah. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like he's emotional for having just proclaimed this, but then he's also really impressed by this kid knowing where that was quoted from. And it's yes. like just like a very subtle thing. I love everything about this scene. So, so good. That's why I'm talking about it so much. Uh, I just like the show, if you can't tell. I hope they keep it up. Uh, And then Jesus concludes this whole little dialogue with them. He says, I have loved spending this time with you. You are all so very special. I hope that all my future students will listen to me as you do, but I suspect they do not have the understanding you do. And I hope that when the time comes, they will tell others about me. Like you have. And this is where he looks at Abigail. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in doing so, he's also looking out to us, right? And he's saying, hey, see how this little girl went and she got Joshua and then he got her friends? Yeah. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. Exactly. Right? A lot of times as Christians, what we do, we go to church for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We read our Bible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We pray for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's not Christianity. I don't know what it is, but it's not Christianity. Christianity is something that's outwardly focused. It's about loving God and loving others. When you hear about Jesus and you see what he did, you shouldn't be able to sit still and just focus on yourself. you got to go out and share it. Yes. Abigail, she didn't even meet Jesus yet. She saw this dude. She's like, he seems cool. I'm going to go get Joshua. Then they met him. They're like, i got to tell everybody. Yeah. And they started coming every day. And the group kept getting bigger and bigger. That should be how Christianity is. It shouldn't be some fad that we're just like, ooh, cool, self-help guru. Like, like, That's not what it is. Mm -hmm. You come to Jesus because he deserves to be worshipped. And we go get other people so that they can also see this person who deserves to be worshipped. And that's what Jesus is saying to Abigail. He's like, man, I hope that one day people will learn to do the same thing you did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good message to end this on. Absolutely, yeah. And so he says that, uh, and then the kids leave. right? And then uh, we cut to the next day. Or actually, we don't cut to the next day yet. We cut to that nighttime. And Jesus is hammering something. And he's looking at it. And he's smiling. And then he Mm -hmm. hunches down. And he starts like writing a little note on a block of wood. Mm. Uh, And then we cut to the next day. This Mm. is the final scene of the whole show. And Abigail, she walks up, and she finds that the camp has been abandoned. Yes. And she walks up to the camp, and she's like, aw. You know, she's kind of disappointed. But then she sees that there's, like, kind of, I guess, how would you describe Like a wooden play set? Yeah. Yeah, like like, there's, like, uh, horse stalls and, like, little carved horses. Really beautiful stuff mm-hmm. given the tools he had back then right yeah uh, very good work you, you're like oh man god must have made that <laughs> uh very very impressive and then jesus left her a little note that says mm-hmm. abigail it was so good getting to know you and i just want you to know i did not come just for the rich yes uh, I love that scene. yeah and then she just she's like oh cool and then she sits down and she starts playing with the stuff and mm-hmm. then it just kind of pans out and you know the screen goes the chosen yeah uh and there's the episode mm-hmm. and so now i've done a lot of talking it's time to let you talk. Okay. What did you think about the episode? What else do you have in your notes? What uh-huh. all do you want to say? Also, okay. you've got a low battery. I do. It's okay. We'll clear that out. Uh, okay. So the only other thing that I haven't said was um, the ending scene. That I said that I really loved the ending scene because yes. it kind of shows Jesus' Under the tree? heart. N- no, no, like the very last. Oh, the very last. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Whenever she goes to see like the place and everything, I really mm-hmm. liked that because um, it just kind of shows like Jesus' heart. And just kind of showing how caring and what a giving person he is. Mm-hmm. Um, that he isn't, you know, I guess what we always make him to be, like, you mm-hmm. know, stripping the humanity yet again. But we just kind of see that one more time, and I really liked that. And then overall for the episode, I really like how um, it's so applicable. I think everything that they talk about, like, it's a it's really good produced show. They write it very well. It's mm-hmm. very entertaining, you know, it keeps your attention, but the thing that always sticks out to me is how they make it so applicable. They put so many, 
you know, different little pockets of scripture here and there. And it makes you sit back as like the person who's watching the audience and be like, wow, how can I apply this to my life? How Mm -hmm. can I, how can I implement those things that he's saying in the show? And it honestly, there's a lot of scenes that are really convicting. Mm -hmm. So I think they did a really good job at balancing that. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Like even how you mentioned that, because they don't explicitly give like sermons or anything. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. What Jesus is doing, it's exactly, really what they're doing is the same thing scripture does. Yes. Right? Where it's like Jesus is just saying something and he's teaching people and then we have to learn to apply it. Mm-hmm. The issue is that sometimes in scripture, we've heard the things so many times that the words become dead to our ears and that we read them and sometimes we even read them in the totally incorrect context, mm-hmm. right? To where we've heard them taught one way that if you ever actually just read the passage all the way through, you wouldn't even understand how that verse makes sense in context yes. because you're reading it from the way that you've been taught rather than in the actual context of the verse, right? So we have our own way of like understanding this stuff, and sometimes it just we don't apply it. So it's actually kind of nice to have the same lessons being taught through this medium of like you know this TV show because they're not changing the lessons. It's the same stuff that you read in the Bible. Right. It's just being presented in a way where you know you have a person playing the part of Jesus who is delivering these lessons to people who are playing the parts of real people, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And he's just showing how those lessons interact with daily life. And you're saying, hmm, I guess there's probably some way for me to do that. Basically, um, they're taking how, you know, how pastors usually do sermon illustrations. Mm -hmm. They're basically taking the sermon illustrations and they're taking the scripture and they're melding them together, Mm -hmm. right? And that's basically what The Chosen is, right? It's like, okay, well, let's create these different scenarios with these, some of these characters are from the Bible, some of them are not. And we're going to use them and put them in different scenarios wherein we can interweave the stories that Jesus tells or the teachings that he teaches or the stories that he lives out. Uh, and we're going to see how we can use those to teach his people a lesson. Yes. Absolutely. And so I, I would agree with you with that. Like, uh, there's a lot of application that we can take out of the show. And I think it's really cool. Do you have anything else that you'd like to say about the show, like the episode in general or anything? think so okay it's my, my favorite one so far yeah well that being said uh in these episodes we've been rating them uh-huh. right so i think episode one i, I i've been doing it differently three. right so i've been rating these episodes given the whole season in yes. view right so i've been rating them like i know all the episodes in the show and so i'm rating them in relation to the whole episode so like if i give it episode a one it's not that i hated the episode it's just that because I, I actually like every episode spoiler alert i just like all of them yeah uh, if i give it a one it's not that i disliked it it's just that it was the weakest episode of all of them or something you know um but i've, I've been having the people who join me rate them just based on that episode alone or what they've seen so far yeah right so based on that how would you rate this episode out of five stars yeah i would give this one five Five? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. It's and really good. I know I said in our episode two video, I think, I, I said that I would have a tough time giving something a five unless it had something that was directly based on scripture. Mm-hmm. And this episode does not have that. This episode has nothing, like this whole interaction with Jesus and the kids, it's not based on scripture. But man, I've got to give it a five because there's so much of it that is rooted in scripture. Yes. And I'm more, I'm an Old Testament guy. Like I love, like I'm, I love the New Testament too. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But because we neglect the Old Testament a lot in our churches, it makes me more excited to study the Old Testament because I'm less familiar with it, I guess, you know? Uh, and so whenever I see things implementing the Old Testament, I just get really pumped and excited. Yeah. And so that just, that bumps this episode up to a five for me because literally I was just so excited to be writing so many notes mm-hmm. for this episode. I was like, you know, it's not a long episode, but there's so much in here. Like yeah. every Lots single line stuff. was either like historical, cultural, or biblical. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, this is good. Like I literally, You're having to pause it. <laughs> I was pausing it so much and I felt bad. I was like, hey, I'm sorry. But luckily she'd seen the episode before, so yeah. I wasn't interrupting it, but... Yeah, I'd agree. It's a five. Mm-hmm. Five it's for really me. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'll either have Brienne or I'll have somebody else with me uh, in few fut- in another video. I don't know. We'll figure it out. I'm kind of just like seeing who's free and being like, hey, want to come help film this video with me? So uh, thank you for once again helping us out with another chosen video. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't see her in the next chosen video, uh, you'll see her in other future videos coming yeah. up soon, uh, mainly because we filmed a lot of them already. Uh, but yeah, you might see her in the next one. I have no idea who we got planned, but we'll be back with chosen episode four. Let us know what you think about the chosen and uh, let us know what you'd rate it. Let us know what your favorite scene is. Just let us, let's just talk about The Chosen. I like that. Uh, let us know in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed, 
Why not? Is it because I ramble too much? I understand that. <laughs> but you should still subscribe and still turn on the notification bell. Uh, because you know what? Mm -hmm. If you subscribe and turn on the notification bell, maybe if you keep watching our videos, you'll eventually come along one where I'm not rambling as much. And so really, you should just tune in more and more to see if I ever stop rambling. Yeah. You know, so I think that's just a challenge. That, that's why yeah. you need to subscribe. That, that's Definitely. why you should do it. Yes. See, will David ever stop talking? Probably not. But <laughs> Stay tuned to find out. Yeah, stay tuned <laughs> to find out. All right. Uh, until we see you next time, I'm David. And I'm Brian. And this has been Now Let's Be Honest About Movies. Bye.